Okay then, at these conferences I've had the great pleasure of being the warm-up man for many a neurologist, but never a neurologist and also a stand-up comedian. I'm not quite sure whether it was a previous life or whether it's a parallel life, but Dr. John P uh, Paul Leach, consultant neurologist in the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow, is our keynote speaker. He will probably explain what I mean by the stand-up uh, comedian bit and he is reputed to be a very accomplished and very entertaining speaker and there's no reason why we can't have a bit of humour even with a serious subject like epilepsy. So, managing epilepsy, shattering stigma, could you please put a warm Irish welcome for our Scottish cousin, John Paul Leach. Thank you. Good morning everyone. Can you, can you hear me okay? Now, it's a challenge to get the technology to work, but it's also a challenge to get my Scottish accent <laughs> comprehensible over the next hour. That's your is, is, that, is that the one that's working? That's the one. Right. Um, I realised that when the Queen came over to Dublin, she spoke in uh, the Gaelic at the start, and uh, that was really to apologise for several hundred years of oppression and enmity, and, and I don't feel I have to apologise for that, but I would like to apologise for the proclaimers and... Uh, <laughs> the Bay City Rollers, uh, and having said which, you gave us Jedward, so I think we're evens, to be honest. And we also gave you Gary Mackay, okay, and don't think we'll forget that. Um, I'm John Paul Leach, I'm uh, originally from Glasgow, and uh, at this point I usually like to say uh, thank you very much, Mum and Dad, for bringing me up in Glasgow and calling me John Paul, that was uh, fabulous, yes, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Bring me up in New York and call me Osama, why don't you? <laughs> the main thing. And of course, of course, everybody, you can imagine at school in the, in, in the late 60s and early 70s, the, the abuse you would get for being called John Paul as some sort of cod French person. And then all of a sudden, uh, Carol Voitilla decided that John Paul was a good name for a pope. All of a sudden, kudos all round, yes. <laughs> first by about 12 years, and occasionally I'll get people who will say to me, so were you called John Paul after the Pope? And say, Look at this face, really, you know, we're not talking the late 70s here. Um, I, I got involved in, in epilepsy research uh, when I was working in diabetes in, in Glasgow, and I was looking for a, a, a research job, and uh, I got offered a, a job in clinical pharmacology. And as it turned out, this was in the clinical pharmacology of, of the new anti-epileptic drugs. And uh, I got involved in this, and I promised I would do a year's research at most. And four and a half years after that, finally completed the work and, and moved on. And uh, th this is a, a number of photos of my, my hometown, um, where I uh, was born and, and raised. And there are a couple of unusual things about this collection of pictures. Uh, number one, there's some blue skies there, which is unusual for, for Glasgow. The, the, there is a collection of uh, skyscapes uh, out in the moment in book form, uh, Glaswegian skyscapes. It's called Fifty Shades of Grey. I don't know if any of you have seen it. And, <laughs> and the other unusual thing is uh, Celtic have just won an away match in Europe there, so that's very unusual all round. And of course, the, the, these are very, very difficult times for Celtic fans in Glasgow. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Al, let's, let's not. Um, suffice to say, I was, I was telling Mike last night that when Rangers, uh, the news of their decline from administration into liquidation and, and bankruptcy and being wound up came out, uh, the day after, Celtic released their new away strip, which was a, a, a nice, very dark strip in, in near black, and the advertising headline was, Celtic, still in the black, uh, not at all rubbing it into our cousins across the river, so that's fine. Um, here's the plan for today. This will take as long as it takes, a, a, an hour's a long time, and if we can still get you awake at the end of the hour, I'll be doing fine. And I, and I want to talk about this notion of, of stigma in epilepsy. And I still can't, I was chatting with Peter about this beforehand, still can't quite get my head round why there should be this feeling of dread and sometimes shame around the diagnosis of epilepsy. But we'll touch on that. We'll touch on the misperceptions that doctors have and why they have that in their experiences and why they're inclined to think the way they do. Um, also ways in which doctors and people involved in epilepsy research will think on epilepsy and how this may impact on how they deal with patients on an individual basis. And also we'll touch uh, very lightly on ways forward here. 
Because my argument would be that when you look at the programme for this afternoon, you get people who are far better qualified to talk about this notion than, than, than I am. The definition of stigma, I've, I've put this up, it's deliberately in, in, in small print. You, lo you look up the definition of stigma, there's a wide range. There are a couple which I've, I've, one in particular I've highlighted here. A mark of disgrace is one of the dictionary definitions. Why should that be applied to a, a disease like epilepsy? A mark or token of infamy, disgrace or reproach. And there's other biological and medical type definitions of stigma. But when people talk about epilepsy stigma, and when people talk about not wanting to discuss their diagnosis or their treatment because they feel shame, and this is the notion to which they're referring. And as Mike said, we've got 30 years ago, people would hide from this diagnosis. It's not that long ago that members of the British aristocracy were hidden from public view because of the diagnosis of epilepsy. And I think we have to face this and look at it. And I think there are signs around us that this notion is still present, albeit thankfully in reduced form. But the fact that it's still there, it really requires that we have to do something about this. Um, I think some people some people still see epilepsy as a different type of illness. I, I was in clinic last week and I, there was a woman came in and she had had a large brain tumour and she'd had it operated on and she did radiotherapy and chemotherapy and she was there with her husband and she was on several medications including two anti-epileptic drugs and she discussed her events and how they'd continued and I took the history of the different types of event that she had and uh, we then had a wee look and an examination and a discussion about all our medication and as we sat down afterwards I said right I, I think I see some of the problems here and obviously these seizures are very difficult for you to deal with at which point her husband butted in oh, no, I, I, I don't think that's right doctor I said sorry oh no no she, she, she doesn't have seizures because she, she doesn't have epilepsy and I said, well, actually, the description sounds very much like seizures. And he said, no, 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 they, they, these, aren't, these are turns. <laughs> and he was happy to discuss brain cancer, effectively. He was happy to discuss chemother chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but not happy that someone might think that his wife had epilepsy. Now, you can argue that the problem lay with him and not with her. But, of course, she would, I'm sure, reap some of the benefits and this reflects on some of the notions of stigma that you'll come across when you try and look some of this stuff up. Because there are two sides to stigma. There's the stigma that people impose on you. Don't ask him. He takes fits. Don't ask him to do it. He's on that medication. Don't ask her because she'll say she'll come and then she'll, then she'll not come because she'll say she's had a seizure. That's the kind of restriction that other people will put on you. But equally debilitating is this notion of felt stigma. I can't tell them because then I'm going to have to talk about my medication. I can't mention that episode that I had last night when I wet the bed because then he'll know that I wet the bed. I can't be with her or him for too much longer tomorrow because I'm feeling bad and I know I'm going to have a seizure sometime. I don't want her or him to see it. And so this notion of feeling the shame and sensing the shame leads people to restrict their own activities. These two things can go together. And the, the couple I mentioned, I'm, I'm sure there was an element of him restricting her and her accepting that restriction. But these can be independent. And you may all be aware of times when you've been in the workplace and someone's restricted what you're being able to do or somebody in the family doesn't want you doing something because they feel bad about your epilepsy or they don't want anyone else to know about it. And this goes back to the historical notions of epilepsy as well. This is the definition and it's quite simple. We all know this, we're all familiar with it, we can conceptualise that, you can look at it, it's not emotional. This is where the brain fires off electrical discharges for no particular reason at that time. They're not there because of a, a b b bashed their head at that time or lacked sleep or had another exposure to another medication that's caused it. These things are just happening. They're popping up from time to time. And when you look at it in an unemotional way, it makes, makes it a bit easier to come to terms with. But still, there is this 
baggage that other people have harken right back to the earliest days when people used to write about epilepsy as some sort of religious, satanic, demonic experience. Uh, and of course it was viewed on in both, both ways, both as a, a blessing and as a curse, sometimes simultaneously in different cultures, strangely. And it was only really with the Enlightenment in the, in the, the 18th century that people began to accept this was really a problem with the brain rather than a problem with divine forces. And look like this, what's there to be ashamed about? Why, why should someone say, oh no, he doesn't have diabetes, his sugar just goes a bit high and he needs to take insulin for it. Or he doesn't have asthma, he just gets breathless and needs to take an inhaler to stop that. No one would dream of saying that. So why then, when we realise this and take it unemotionally, would you ever dream of saying he doesn't have epilepsy, he just has turns and the medication helps prevent them? There are some legal impositions and, and we still come across this in the clinic and I realise the regulations in Ireland are different from the regulations in the UK. Um, and some people take this as stigma. Of course, you would like to think that now the days of imposing restrictions on marriage or reproduction or other aspects of lifestyle are long gone. And in a sense, government will have a duty to place some restrictions on people's activity if that would put someone else in danger. Um, that still causes problems and you'll still have people who will not disclose their seizures or their epilepsy, continue though they are, to the DVLA, the, our driving uh, regulators. Um, and as I say, I know the regulations differ in, in Ireland, um, but in, in the UK I think they're a bit more restrictive. And I think I wouldn't define this as stigma. I would define this as the government's job and as long as the government can be called to account by medical forces and, and by their voters, um, really to make sure these restrictions are reasonable and both for the safety of the, the person with epilepsy and for the general public, I think that's, I think that's reasonable. Where does stigma come from? Well, I, I, you read a lot of the papers in, on stigma and there's an implication that in some way the general public have a, an inherent evil and inherent badness that wants to label people as, as having something, uh, that wants to deliberately label them as being different or dangerous or set apart. And, and I don't think so. I think this is all down to, to ignorance and misperceptions. And again, they may well have this idea of a epilepsy being a disorder of unprovoked seizures, but sometimes they don't make that leap to this unprovoked nature of it, and we'll come on to this. The notion of prejudice, I think, is a wee bit overstated, and we'll, we'll come on to why I think maybe this isn't quite as marked as people think. Um, and then discrimination as well, and, and one man's health and safety is another man's overprotectiveness or discrimination. And I, I think that's a notion that we all have to keep trying to individualise and look at what's safe and helpful for you. When you look at all the papers on, on stigma, um, to be honest, it, it bamboozles me. You, you get academics who will have huge long sentences and paragraphs and trying to distill it down. The, the, these are their thoughts. Uh, this idea that really people understand what seizures are and they understand what epilepsy is, but they think it's very dangerous and therefore something not to be touched. They think, could it be that any chronic illnesses it will cause you to be viewed by society as different, less valuable? Um, well, I would argue right off that I, I don't think that's true because people will happily talk about their diabetes and their asthma and their Parkinson's disease, which are def by definition chronic illnesses that will limit your activity sometimes more than others. So I would argue that I don't think the second one, second one fits. Is it that the loss of control during seizures is what scares people off, uh, as they've put it in their academic language, a reversion to the primitive, violating cultural norms? In other words, not quite the done thing to get up in the middle of a, 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 a mass, a service at mass, and get up and wander around or mumble. That's a bit embarrassing and really not something you want to go near. I think that might be partly true, but that's not really what people understand of epilepsy. That's not really what they imagine epilepsy is. And I would imagine the people in this room have a much better idea as to what seizures mean and what they entail and what they result in than the general public does. 
and yet they're the ones that will sometimes, sometimes have a problem with having a full integration of people with epilepsy. So I, I'm not sure that really any of these entirely encapsulate why people have a problem with epilepsy. I think there's no doubt that really this idea of not understanding it, this inability to understand what's going on during seizures and what causes epilepsy is really what leaves people slightly in the dark. And the longer they're left in the dark and without campaigns like this to shatter stigma and give information, the less we have people coming forward and saying, guys, I've got epilepsy. And I'm not telling you that because I might be a threat to you, I might be a danger to myself. It's just to let you know that I have to take these treatments and sometimes I might need to be off for a day unexpectedly. These things happen, but I'm still me and you've known me for a long time. That doesn't change. What's wrong with surveys? I'm, go I'm going to show this, the, the, this graph here. and um, You'll see it a couple of times today, but there's, there's one point to this, if this will show up. Um, this, this was initially designed to look at what people thought of terms like epileptic or people with epilepsy. Um, but I think it's w w this harks back to the point I made earlier on. I think we sometimes infer, we sometimes think that people are more prejudiced than they are. And so I think it's down to the design of some of these questions. Um, do you think that people with epilepsy have more difficulties to get employed? Well, 70% have said yes there. Um, and yes, unemployment's higher, but th there's an inference there that in some way people in the general public don't think people with epilepsy to get a job. And I, I think that's a mis-inference. Uh, th they all deny prejudice. I mean, people do. That, that's exactly what they do. And, and, and actually, in this case, I, I think they might have a point. Do you think that people with epilepsy are rejected by society? 41% said yes. I find that difficult to imagine. The, the person who's answering the survey isn't rejecting them. Why would they imagine that people are being rejected by society? Is it because they never hear anyone say, I have epilepsy, I have seizures? It's difficult to know. But we'll come back to this later on because it's got another point to it. In terms of stigma, I've split it up into th three sources, three main types of stigma. Um, and I'm talking really about the perceptions that people have about epilepsy here. So we're talking about sometimes the misperceptions of the disease and the burdens it places can sometimes impact on relationships, both professional and personal. So let's talk about medical misperceptions. The problem with doctors is that when they come across epilepsy, it's when they're working in accident and emergency, it's when they're working in general medical wards. It's when they're working in uh, inpatient facilities and in, in neurology wards. And wh where do they come across patients with epilepsy? They come across them during a seizure, immediately after a seizure, or when seizures flare up. And one of the points I keep having to make to patients with, the, uh, you know, to the, the junior doctors that we have is the epilepsy that you see isn't quite unrepresentative. A, of the epilepsy population at large, B, of that person's life in general. You're seeing a snapshot of that patient's life when they're at their worst. This is not them. You have to look at the broad picture. As a result, they sometimes have this skewed idea that because they've seen one person who's been in and out of accident and emergency three, four, five times a month, that that in some way, well, that's epilepsy. No, no, no. No, this, this is not. This idea of it's not a normal brain that's causing this. That's why they are the way they are. Well, you don't know the way they are. You've only seen the way they are in several different small time points over the last few months. They think, again, that because the patients with epilepsy they see tend to be ones who are more severe and less well controlled, that epilepsy is this awful disease that they can't treat. A marker, again, that it's all this damage in the brain that's causing this. Many of them will not have experience of the newer medications. They think it's all down to, uh, as well as that, that we're having to use all these drugs that are decades old that cause all these side effects and are terrible to mix. And of course, because, again, they see the worst effects of seizures, they, and because also we have a, this risk-averse culture spread all the way over from the States, certainly to Scotland, I would imagine it's hitting home here as well, they have this idea of always worried about what harm may come. How can I be seen not to be contributing to harm? And in some ways, how can I be seen to help this patient along and not be 
party to any harm that they come to. Let's look at the facts of these misperceptions. This is a, a famous paper, uh, again, it's originated in Glasgow in the, the, the epilepsy unit at the Western Infirmary. And this goes to show that actually the majority of patients do very well. The majority of patients become seizure-free either with the first or second drug that they try, that's 60%. Now, this is not looking at the new drugs. This is looking mostly at the old drugs. And I would like to think that as our new drugs have come online and they've had fewer side effects and that actually patients can take them easier for longer, that actually the orange and the light blue there will become bigger and bigger. And remember as well, the not seizure-free, the yellow chunk there on the right, that encapsulates a whole multitude of sins from the person who has one episode every two years or a greater interval between seizures down to the patients who yes will continue to have frequent seizures so this is by no means saying that one third will be totally debilitated on a regular uh, basis by episodes of seizure and doctors don't realize this this is not hit home and if they don't realize it they don't tell patients with a new diagnosis that this is what's ahead and that the chances are high of getting seizure free and that I think underlies a lot of the worry and fear and maybe indeed shame that people have when they come along to the clinic. This is another graph, it's a slightly complex graph but it shows this from the SANAD study which looked at a lot of different anti-epileptic drugs and basically you see that about half the patients who were started on a medication after the first year can be, can be said I've had no more episodes now since I started medication and that this figure grows with time. Back to this idea, most people with epilepsy will do well with medication. That's not to trivialise the burden of disease that we have. That's not to say that we ignore the patients who have ongoing problems, but it's to say we have to be realistic to people who roll up to the clinic for the first time having had seizures. We have to be realistic and give them a, a reasonable and hopefully accurate outlook. The other fact is that the drugs are quite different and by far the majority of patients will tolerate medication. This is another set of slides from the SANAD study. This idea that these drugs are really horrible and you, people really can't tolerate them is just not true. Yes, you'll have this drop off in the first six or uh, four to six months where some people will find the side effects worse or they don't find the seizures are getting under control so they then have to change medication. But you see this curve flattens out. Once people are stabilised on a medication, they can stay on it, usually not necessarily side effect free. I'm not going to be too optimistic, but they're certainly a lot better than they were. And that's uh, episodes of epilepsy related to areas of scarring in the brain. That's partial onset epilepsy. And when we look at generalised epilepsy, the figures are even higher. Even more patients are remaining on the medication without side effects in the long term. So this idea that the drugs are all horrible and toxic and really difficult to take, I think nowadays is becoming less and less true. And again, that's not to minimise. I'm not saying we don't need to do more work to get more treatments and find better combinations and get better treatments for each individual. But it's to try and put this in context and try and correct some of the, the bias that we have among our, the, the, the doctors looking after us. And incidentally, this is not a comment at all on any of my colleagues in neurology who are dealing with epilepsy. This is more a, a, a comment on the kind of care that happens out with specialist centres. The accident the emergency doctor who gives the diagnosis or the GP or the psychiatrist or the clinical pharmacologist. And that's why I think Colin Doherty's move to increase the number of specialists, and I'm talking neurologists and uh, epilepsy nurses is absolutely vital because this is the only way we're going to get this message across to the people who need it when they need it. The drug choice is expanding and improving and, and, and again doctors often when they will think about epilepsy will think mostly about phenytoin, carbamazepine, sodium valproate and at least two of those drugs are older than I am um, and the drug that we now call one of the new anti-epileptic drugs is lamotrigine which was introduced in 1990 that's how long ago that was. It's still one of our most popular drugs. And yet many doctors, not specialists dealing with epilepsy, but many doctors will think on this as one of these fancy new drugs. Is there a drug for Parkinson's or asthma or diabetes that was introduced in 1990 that people would think of as new? No. I mean, I think this belies, illustrates how little knowledge there is among non-specialists about epilepsy and its treatment. Just a quick run through the number of drugs. The names of the drugs are immaterial. The whole point is that since 1991, when we had Vigabatin and Lamotrigine coming on stream, the number of drugs has almost tripled. 
And in fact, when you look at many of these medications, you would not really have been keen on being on these long term. Now, for some patients, the older ones are perfect. For some patients. But for more and more patients, we're getting some of these drugs on board. And the latest one, which has been uh, given a licence in the UK, but we're not been quite allowed to use yet in this economic climate, it needs some other hurdles to jump, is this... Para th and there are other drugs on stream. There are other options here. And I keep saying to people, look, OK, we've not found the treatment for you yet, but there are other ones in stream, and I'm not going to be overly optimistic, I'm not going to be unrealistic about this, but the fact is that we will continue with lacosamide, ritigabine, and I'm sure parampinol when we're allowed to use it, to get patients seizure-free or near seizure-free who weren't seizure-free before. And it's another reason why specialist care is so important. Another reason why we need the consultants and the nurses online seeing the patients near the time of diagnosis and the patients having access to that follow-up in later years. We all know the ideal things we want from drugs. We want complete seizure freedom. We want no adverse effects. We want treatment that you can take once or twice a day and not have to take your dose in with you to work or take it when you're away for a day trip. Um, we want to know that we're going to reduce the burden of epilepsy and remove any harm from seizures. And we want to be able to maintain a normal lifestyle. And, and I think some of these were, were not there yet. I would like to think we're a lot closer than we were in 1990, but we're not there yet. We need to keep ourselves motivated and more than that, we need to keep patients motivated to keep asking to go the extra mile. And sometimes that will involve going along to the clinic and saying, actually, I'm, I'm, you've chopped and changed things a lot over the last two years. I'm a bit done just now. Can we visit this again in six months? Yeah, let's visit it when you really feel you've got the energy and the time and the desire to take this a bit further. And I think that's one of the messages today and I, I hesitate to tell you all what to say when you go and see your clinicians, but I think it's absolutely true. Drugs and treatment changes and changes in treatment pattern will not work unless you commit to them. If you don't feel you can commit to them, doctors will not get annoyed if you say, can we call time for six months on this? And I think you have to be in control of either saying, can we hang off on treatment changes, or alternatively, actually, I know you think that one seizure a month is not too bad, but this is really getting me down. Is there anything we can try to try and take this a bit further? Because sometimes you will come across times and doctors and clinics and days where sometimes the doctors will maybe think, well, that's a lot better than it was three years ago. Fine, it is a lot better than it was three years ago, but my epilepsy is still bothering me and I would quite like to try something a wee bit more active if that's possible. The other point, of course, is that, as I say, in this risk-averse culture, you often get GPs writing in to say, this person's been diagnosed having epilepsy, they've had two seizures in the last nine months, and he wants to take up cycling now, and I've told him that he really shouldn't do this. Well, what, what does that mean? I mean, if he goes away for eight hours in an isolated spot along rocky coves on his own, that might not be sensible at the moment might be absolutely sensible in two years' time when he's been seizure-free and well-controlled by medications. But if it means that he's then put off going for a half-hour cycle up and down the hill with his, uh, with his wife or his, his friends or whatever, that does not make sense. You're not doing this man's health any good in the long run by placing restrictions on him. And when I say health, I mean both physical health and, of course, his own self, self, sense of well-being and his own outlook in life. You're not doing his morale any good by placing undue restrictions. So I think restrictions have to be a, a dialogue, not a simple restriction. And there are legal ones who will not get round. There are legal ones who will not be able to overcome. But I think a dialogue with people makes perfect sense. And that doesn't mean to say, well, it's on your head, you do it, it's up to you, I'm having nothing to do with it. That's not a dialogue. That's doctors sometimes taking too much of a back seat. There's been a lot of discussion in the last few years about death and epilepsy. We've, we've had a couple of bad cases of, of uh, legal inquiries related to death and epilepsy, and I, I want to just touch on this today because it's another reason that people sometimes, they don't like talking about death and they don't like talking about epilepsy. You can imagine how little they like talking about death and epilepsy. And yet actually, in the clinic, it can be a very useful thing to bring up at an early stage. You might not talk about death, you might talk about coming to harm. You might talk about an effect of seizures on the heart rate of the breathing, but if you can put it in context, you might actually allay that parent's fear who saw this 
terrifying thing for the first time of their child having a seizure and is convinced that A, there's going to be lots of them, probably not true, and B, that the person is in imminent danger of a high chance of coming to harm every time they have a seizure, which of course is not true. And I'm not minimising seizures. I'm not saying that we don't care about people having seizures. I'm saying that we have to put this risk in context. Look at, this is the, the group of patients who are newly diagnosed. This is probably the most relevant to, to many of the people when they come up to the clinic, get their diagnosis and get their treatment started. We can see that the incidence of death is, is there. And this is over a long number of patient years, a long follow-up. The risk of death is relatively low. You can see there were none in the generalised, none classified arm and few in, in, in the partial epilepsy arm. So add them together, less than one in a thousand. And when you look at the patients who've come to grief after having had a single seizure and then there's been follow-up again, very long patient follow-up over the course of eight years, 10 or 15% of these patients were older than 60 at the time of onset of the study. So the number of deaths is, yes, it's there. I'm not trivialising it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But let's put it in context. This is not a high risk for the vast majority of patients, all other things being equal. This is looking at the death rate due to, and I've, I've used diabetes a, a number of times, because it does in some ways mirror what happens with epilepsy. You get given a diagnosis by a doctor, sometimes on the basis of a test, who then gives you medicine to take all the time, gives you lifestyle advice, and keeps you follow up at clinic. So there are similarities with epilepsy. And you can see that there's a significant death rate with diabetes as well, when you look at the similar ages of people who come on stream with the diagnosis. So we have to think that epilepsy is not a part in causing health problems. And you know, let's not pretend it's the only one that causes health problems. I want to get rid of any long-term complications altogether. Of course I do. But the one thing I'm not going to do is get, do anyone any favours by overstating the risk. And I think the restrictions in the lifestyle we've kind of covered. This is a, a dialogue. This should not be imposed. Uh, and I accept there will be legal restrictions. But uh, when you look at how restricted in lifestyle some people are when they've had very infrequent, very short-lived, really quite mild seizures, and this is not quite stigma, but it approaches it when you're told all the time, I don't let her go upstairs unless I'm there and can walk behind her and someone who's not had a seizure for two years. I think that's unduly restrictive. So if we look at the medical perception against the facts, this exposure to severe epilepsy at a bad time in the illness leads to th these misperceptions, none of which really, I think, tally with the facts as we know them. What about the public? Again, the reason I think, and I'll go back to this case of the, the woman with the brain tumour who had the seizures on, on treatment, I think it's this acceptance that epilepsy is in some way a euphemism for brain damage. Now, yeah, there's something happening in the brain that's causing the seizures, but there's something that happens in the brain that causes Parkinson's. No one calls that brain damage. Something that happens in the brain that causes Alzheimer's. No one calls that brain damage. And we were discussing with Peter earlier on, why should epilepsy, despite the fact that it comes and goes, why should epilepsy attract this association with brain damage. I think this is historical and we blame older generations for a lot of things. Uh, and I think this is one of the ways in which, in some ways, when I've heard it used in a, in a pejorative term, it has tended to come from, from older patients. This idea as well, that the public think that epilepsy is seen mostly in, in, in children. Um, this is the second time you've seen this slide. And, and the reason we show this is to show that actually patients feel differently, or sorry, the general public feel differently, if you refer to someone as being epileptic rather than a person with epilepsy. And all the negative connotations that people have attributed increase when the question is phrased differently. Do you think that epileptics have more difficulty getting employed? Well, there's a much higher percentage say yes to that than would say yes to someone with epilepsy. Do you think that epileptics are rejected by society? And they suggest that it's twice as many have said yes to that as have said yes to the idea of do you think that patients with people with epilepsy are rejected by society? And, you know, in some ways, uh, you can always argue about political correctness gone mad and the Daily Mail thing. But the fact is, there may be an element of truth here that a name does matter. 
and maybe we all have to be careful. And when you look, do Google searches, when you do PubMed searches, literature searches, looking for the term epileptic, before about 1985, 1989, a lot of papers referred to uh, treatment of 20 epileptics with a drug or uh, 14 epileptic children, etc., uh, etc. Et that, that stopped. They will refer to uh, neurons or channels or discharges or EEG changes as being epileptic, but now, thankfully, apart from the odd one that will sneak in from foreign language journals, you will not refer to people as epileptic, and I, and I think that's a significant advance, and I didn't realise how significant adva an advance that would be until you see graphs like this. This idea that it's only in children, that's another reason that people think, because of epilepsy is brain damage, and so therefore it's one of these things that people are born with. And actually you can see here, the whole point of this slide is that every country that's been looked at, you get a high incidence in childhood, it then gets less in middle age, and then as you get older the incidence goes up again. The good news of course being, if there is good news about it, and there are some positive aspects that when you get seizures in later life, they tend to respond better to medication, often at quite low doses. So as I say to patients, there's good news and bad news that you do have epilepsy, you do have seizures, I think you will need medication, but I think your chance of responding are even higher than it would be in, in someone younger. I think patients have the same misperceptions as the general public, because most of them have no idea. They didn't choose this. They weren't given forewarning. They come along to the clinic, having had some episodes of collapse, hoping they weren't seizures, and then someone speaking to them about a diagnosis of epilepsy. So they're left with exactly the same misperceptions as the general public, except that they're even less keen to talk about it, because then that shows themselves as being someone needing help, needing medication, needing restrictions in their lifestyle. So what about doctors? Are, are they the ones that should be helping combat stigma? Doctors, voluntary sector? Well, yes and no. And I'm always a bit wary about researchers. Because no one does research studies unless they want other people to read them. And you see I've put there this quote at the bottom. This is a, a headline reputedly from the Times. Uh, this would not have sold many newspapers. It's accurate. It's true, it's factually correct. Not many dead, small earthquake, but it's not going to sell many newspapers. And similarly, people who publish research want findings that are going to A, make their paper readable, and B, attract further funding for this very important finding that they've just made. So as a result, I, I'm always a wee bit wary of research and the tones that it can sometimes give and the implications that it can have. Because there's this medical dichotomy and, you know, we all are aware of simultaneous but contradictory beliefs. You can believe two separate things at the same time. And here are my two separate things that I can believe about Celtic. Of course I can believe that we have been champions of Europe and this might happen again. But I can also believe and understand that actually there are going to be far more often times where we end up with circumstances like this for Inverness Caledonian and of course the big problem about this was not so much that Inverness Caledonian beat Celtic unexpectedly but that I was living down in Liverpool and this headline was cut out of the newspaper and pasted all round the hospital for me and if I have one if I have one regret of my time in Liverpool is that I left in late 2002 and in early 2003 this happened and I'm I managed to get tickets from my friend to go and see Celtic play Liverpool at Anfield and we won 2-0. And of course I was gutted that I was in the minibus back to Glasgow when I should have been going into the Walton Centre at 9 o'clock the next morning saying, well how about that then? <laughs> Never mind. So that's my only regret about Liverpool. Fantastic city, fantastic time, great neurology unit, but I, I wasn't quite there at the right time. <coughs> so what about the medical dichotomy? What about these? contradictory beliefs that people have, even those who know about epilepsy. Well, first of all, they believe that epilepsy consists of recurrent, unprovoked seizures. This is what we call it. It's a paroxysmal disorder. It comes and goes. Migraine is a paroxysmal disorder. Asthma, in many ways, can be a paroxysmal disorder. These cause problems which then subside. People are normal, and that's fine. And doctors who treat epilepsy will often have this view but everywhere they go, and of course it's important they also realise that epilepsy does cause an array of problems in the brain and in life in general. 
And these two beliefs, i.e., come on, seizures will get them under control, and at the same time, actually there are things here we need to look out for, lead to a bit of a dichotomy. This is the view of the paroxysmal disorder. Yes, you've had seizures. I'm going to start you on medication. I hope that we'll get you seizure-free or we'll at least reduce the number that you'll have or we'll reduce the severity of them. And this is hopefully going to allow you to have a much better working life, family life. We might get you back driving if we can restrict the timing or the type of the seizures. Get you back to doing the sports that you want to do with appropriate safety measures. And that travelling that you've always wanted to do, we'll put that back in the agenda again. Of course, this idea that it's more than a paroxysmal <coughs> disorder that's causing ongoing difficulties in the brain, and you'll hear the researchers and you'll hear the doctors say, oh, one third of our patients have got problems with depression and anxiety. Um, the drugs can really be quite serious. We have to watch the drugs in pregnancy. We have to uh, avoid other problems. Patients being told that they can't drink alcohol at all. Youngsters being told they can't go to places where there's flashing lights. All sorts of restrictions that must, if you can't drink and you can't go to a place with fa flashing lights, must be the equivalent to checking into the nearest uh, order, frankly, for, for many of my teenage patients, the way things are. Um, and of course, it's reasonable to have some view of this. As long as the bad things are being used, A, as a motivation to seek out the problems and hopefully treat them and address them, maybe a way to minimise them with the treatment that you've got, and maybe a way, an impetus to try carrying on research and audit and maybe lab work to try and find out what it is that's causing these so that, again, you're going to open the door to further treatment. What about the voluntary sector? Well, the voluntary sector has, has changed enormously. I, I'll never forget, as a, a medical student in the mid-1980s, going to uh, what was the Scottish Epilepsy Association, and their headquarters were in the same, exact same place they are now, and what they did was they took us in, they gave us all a cup of tea and said, we're the Scottish Epilepsy Association, we help patients with epilepsy, and this is how we do it. So they gave us a wee chat about how many people there were with epilepsy, and then they took us into the next door room, which was a workshop. And what they did was they gave people with severe epilepsy a place to come and do uh, some work with you know, tools and lathes under supervision from people who made sure they were safe. And that seemed, and maybe I'm misremembering this, but I don't think so when I talk to people from, from those days, it seemed that it was an organisation that provided support and help when things were tough but really didn't do more than that. And we've seen the voluntary sector change hugely in Scotland and across Europe and hopefully in more and more places worldwide. The voluntary sector has become a place really where, yes, they'll accept that epilepsy is a treatable disorder, but what they've done is they've taken this statement down here, a common disabling potentially fatal disease, and used that to influence the politicians the health authorities. They've used it to convince people that resources and treatment should be devoted to patients with epilepsy and that undue restrictions are unnecessary and in fact when you give help to patients you can make a difference there. So although the voluntary sector have this dichotomy as well, they realise that many patients will do well on treatment. They will sometimes focus on that second one because that's what makes the difference. And this influence in politicians, this ability to garner public funds for research and public funds for treatment projects and, and for improving daily care, I think is absolutely vital in the, public, in the voluntary sector and something we just didn't see decades ago. I don't think that suspicion and malice underlies much of the uh, stigma. This idea of shame, fear, non-disclosure. I, I don't think it is. I, I think people just don't get exposed to the stories of patients with epilepsy. And when I look at the patients who come to our clinics in Glasgow, um, the lawyers, the professors, the professional sportsmen, the artists, some relatively well-known faces around Scotland, and you're in that difficult position where to have somebody with the courage and, and I don't use that word lightly, the courage of somebody like Ricochet to come out and discuss his illness, his treatment, how it affects him, more importantly, how it doesn't affect him, is huge. What a bonus that is. Now, I have to say that we, uh, Mike and I were talking about a, a Scottish sportsman who apparently has epilepsy, he's, he's known in Ireland, and uh, he's been quite open about it. And the astonishing thing is, I didn't know about this. I would put, and this is not he's fairly well known in Scotland as well I would put an absolute pound to a penny that no one no 
person in our neurology or epilepsy unit in Glasgow would know that this man had epilepsy. Um, and again, the inability of people to come out and discuss this is almost self-fulfilling. It becomes a self-fulfilling thing where no one discusses it, therefore let's not talk about it. It's clearly something to be embarrassed and ashamed about, so I'm not going to be the guy that breaks ranks. And that's what makes Ricochet stands, I think, so remarkable. And I would hope so helpful. And I'd be interested to hear if other people find that that's helpful or it breaks down barriers or if it makes things easier, um, because I would love to think that the same kind of thing could happen in Scotland. So the three questions. Does stigma exist? Well, the survey carried out by Brainwave would show that there are certainly elements of it. And this, by definition, when you think back to it, this is looking at felt stigma. This is things that people said when they went on the survey monkey and answered the questions about how they felt about things. And a couple of things to, to draw out. They don't like talking about their epilepsy or their seizures with friends or family. They find the phrase epileptic to be pejorative, derogatory. And again, that's absolutely right. And you can see that that mirrors the view that, patient, that, that the general public have of the term. And I think this shows that in answer to the, the, the question, does it exist? Well, these people think it does. And that, in a way, is the important thing. Because whether or not other people feel it, if only 2% of the population had a degree of enacted or imposed stigma, it wouldn't matter if there are, the figures are as high as this when it comes to people thinking about and talking about their own illness. This is back to this idea about the difficulty in names matter. And I, you know, I didn't realise they mattered quite so much, but I think we realise that. Whose job is it to counteract? Who should we be getting to work against this stigma in persuading patients that this does not, should not, will not happen? Should it be the politicians? I'm not sure they've got much of a, a role. There, are, there is one politician in the UK, an MP, who comes out and talks about her epilepsy and how she's well controlled and able to lead a normal life. But in a legislative sense, I think they've done enough harm in the past with epilepsy and I don't think they need to enact any further legislation to help this along. Is it the doctors? Well, I think it is the doctor. I think it's the doctor's job that in a disorder that's affecting one in 200 patients, they have some idea, some working knowledge of what epilepsy means. And I would like to think that getting medical students and teaching them about epilepsy and its treatment and its outlook and its long-term prognosis will be really helpful in the long term. But that's a long-term game. You're, not, you're looking to influence how people feel 15, 20 years down the line. Um, and I, but I think doctors should realise the realities of epilepsy and being able to put things in context. Is it the voluntary sector? Well, I think the voluntary sector have begun to address this. Are, is it going to make a difference? I think campaigns like this will make a huge difference. But is that because it's brainwave making the statement about shattering stigma, or is that for other reasons? Is it patients? I, I think yes, and I'm not trying to out anyone or force anyone to say anything they're uncomfortable with, but personal testimonies on a one-to-one -one basis, people who know other people who happen to have epilepsy but it's not affected them, etc. That is a, such a powerful story. People live by anecdote. Doctors think they live by evidence. I don't think they do. I think they're hugely influenced by their own personal experience and by individual patients. And patients are no different. They, they operate hugely in anecdote. And if they know someone who's had epilepsy, and if I hear again someone come back to the clinic saying, when we spoke to you, I was really shocked at this diagnosis of epilepsy and I couldn't believe that my daughter had been having seizures all this time. I, I really found it difficult to cope with, but I can't believe how many people have come out, nudged me and said, actually, our David's been having seizures for the last five years. Our Brian's been on treatment since he was 10 for seizures. And, you know, again, this idea that if people don't talk about it, the the usual case, the majority of cases of epilepsy aren't apparent to people, so they aren't aware of the huge breadth of type of uh, severity of illness that epilepsy can convey. Is it patients' families? Well, I think that's, that's very difficult as well, and that uh, I, I don't think would be something I would necessarily feel comfortable with, but you know, I'm not trying to force anyone to say anything they feel uncomfortable about, but I think it's reasonable that we're all up front and we don't hide anything unnecessarily. 
How do we counteract it? Well, I'm not sure I'm the person to, to answer that question. And when you look at the programme today and you hear the stories of the people involved in the programme today, we've got other people who are far better qualified and can speak on a personal level on that. I, you know the old phrase about if, it, if a relationship goes awry, or whether it's professional or personal, living well is the best revenge. And, and I think living well with epilepsy is by far and away the best stigma prevention. And that means not just living well and doing all the things you want to do, it means being free of the fear and the shame. And sometimes that comes from other people, sometimes that's partly granted by other people, but more often than not, it comes from the way you feel about things yourself. I hope that's been comprehensible. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thanks.